Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Stuart Medicine lecture for this evening. I'd like to introduce with uh, great pleasure our speaker for tonight, Jean-Claude Tice. Uh, Jean-Claude is Emeritus Professor of Orthopedic Surgery in the Department of History of uh, Department of History, uh, History yeah. Department of um, Surgical Sciences here at the University. Uh, and uh, so he's going to talk tonight on art and orthopedics as seen through the eye of the artist. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Terry. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, good evening. And uh, thank you for uh, coming to this lecture on this uh, cold and uh, uh, rainy afternoon. And welcome to all those online. Yes, art and orthopedics. Um, you probably would think there's a widely um, different human endeavor, orthopedics and art, uh, but I will show you that um, they have actually quite a lot in common. Um, and uh, um, if you look at an orthopedic surgeon uh, um, doing a uh, hip replacement with blood on his hands and using a hammer and a chisel and compare that to an, a sculptor who does actually do exactly the same with a with a chisel and a, and and a hammer, trying to carve an, um, a statue out of uh, marble or or uh, um, stone. So I will try to uh, show you in the next uh, fifty minutes that uh, we as orthopedic surgeons and artists have a lot in common. So first of all, my disclosures: I'm not an artist, and I am not an art historian. I'm a simple orthopedic surgeon. However, uh, some time ago, a long time ago, actually, I sort of tried to uh, uh, do some painting, uh, um, but I abandoned it and uh, focused my career mainly on orthopedics. Here are two of my uh, uh, paintings I did in the 1990s. The one on the left, you probably see some orthopedic connection. These are actually a number of uh, plasters used in orthopedics uh, to treat fractures and other uh, conditions. Uh, and on the right is sort of some remnant from my medical training, uh, looking through a microscope at the structure uh, of a cell where you recognize some mitochondria and other uh, uh, intracellular uh, uh, organelles. So I'm only going to talk about two of the fine arts, which are basically uh, um, painting and sculpture. There are lots of other uh, art types, but I, I feel that those two sort of uh, are more closely related to uh, uh, orthopedic surgery and surgery in general. On the right hand side, so you first of all, you can see that surgeons and sculptors and paint, painters use their hands a lot. Okay, so that's one important link. Um, on the right hand side, there you see a photograph of a uh, pair of hands of a surgeon using a scalpel and, and a forceps. These are actually the hands of, a, of quite a famous surgeon. Um, um, and interestingly, uh, he, was, uh, um, he was born in Dunedin. Um, uh, and his name is uh, uh, Harold Gillies. Uh, sorry, um, Mackinder. And uh, he was an... Um, um, he was actually born in, uh, in Dunedin and um, went to school in uh, Wanganui Collegiate and then moved to the UK where he studied, he studied uh, um, medicine in Cambridge. Uh, and then at the outbreak of, of World War I, um, he joined the Royal uh, 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 Army Medical Corps and uh, uh, spent some time uh, in the northern part of France, uh, operating on injured soldiers. And uh, before the end of the war, he returned to England and set up an, um, a, an, uh, a department for maxillofacial surgery uh, and dealing with uh, mainly injured soldiers. And, and so you can see here uh, one of his patients, what he managed to do, he, he was very creative and cre sort of developed a, a lot of new uh, procedures with some uh, 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 flaps to uh, uh, reconstruct faces of injured uh, uh, surgeons. And you can see there 
what uh, uh, surgery actually uh, uh, can it achieve. So is this is this art? Is this science? Uh, um, there's probably both of them, uh, and we're going to go looking into that a little bit more in detail. Now, how how was I inspired? Why did I do this talk? Well, one of the reasons is this man, um, he, uh, Lindsay Crooks. He he was a, lo a local artist. Some of you might have known him. I don't know. Uh, and he became a friend of mine because I liked his I liked his art. Um, and he was born in Timaru and went to uh, 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 the School of uh, uh, Arts here at the Polytechnic and became a professional uh, uh, painter. Um, he uh, lived in Brighton where he had his studio uh, and he really um, liked anything to do with the sea. He was actually a very good surfer as well and it was, he was the under over 40 uh, surf champion uh, in the 1970s. So when I got to know him, he was uh, um, talking to me about, he was doing a series on New Zealand workers. Uh, and uh, um, so he'd gone to places like, I mean, construction, fishery, I mean, fish factories, and sort of basically he was very good at, uh, at painting the human, the human figure. And then one day I said to, to, to him, well, Lindsay, we also do some work at the hospital. Why don't you come and do some painting at the hospital, some live painting? And he actually came to theater with me and did some uh, uh, painting uh, of myself. And I'll show you uh, the result. So this, this, was, this is his work. So very, uh, very characteristic Lindsay Crooks. On the, on the left-hand side, you can see this is called the Blue Pool, that, that painting. Uh, you recognize St. Clair, uh, Clair Beach and the hot, uh, water, uh, hot uh, uh, salt water pool. On the right hand is uh, um, a painting from his uh, worker series, some uh, builders constructing a house. So he came, he came um, uh, with me to, to the main operating theater at the hospital here, but also to the day surgery. And here's a painting of, of, of me doing a carpal tunnel operation in day surgery, that painting actually is sort of was on the first floor, it's been recently removed. Um, and so you can see here um, um, myself uh, doing the surgery, you can see there the hand of the patient because the carpal tunnel release is basically releasing an, a nerve uh, uh, just at the level of the wrist. And that's normally done under local anesthetics. So you can see the patient uh, uh, is not fully asleep. And you can see the, the concentration there of myself concentrating my, my vision and also the nurse. Also, everything is concentrated on the hand, which seems like it's, it's isolated from the patient. And we often do that at surgery where we isolate the patient from the operation field for, for sterile uh, purposes. Uh, and it looks like the patient is quite oblivious to what's happening, but I can assure you the patient had no pain because it's done on the local anesthetic. So that, that was, um, Lindsay was very good at live, live painting. The other, the other person I have to thank, uh, who also inspired me as a, as a friend of mine, Professor Benjamin Joseph, he's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon from India, and he published quite a number of articles on orthopedics and pediatric, on art and pediatric orthopedics. And he, he's given me some of his uh, uh, material to use in my talk. I looked a little bit of, of whether there's anything published in relation to art and orthopedic surgery in New Zealand. And the only, the only thing I found is, is, is an article by um, the late Wynne Beasley. Wynne Beasley was an, uh, uh, an orthopedic surgeon in Wellington, uh, and he became quite interested in art and history of medicine. Uh, and he published a lot on, on history of orthopedics, medicine, and surgery. And he published this article here in 1972 in an international journal. And the title of his article was Art in the Service of Orthopedics. And he was saying that uh, he started it off because of its concern. He's talking about orthopedic surgery, orthopedics. Because of its concern with form and function, 
orthopedics is peculiarly well placed to benefit from the work of the artist who may depict the normal or the abnormal in form and function. So that's the only New Zealand publication I found. Now, before I, 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 I continue, uh, I want to, uh, for you to, un to, uh, to go through a few definitions. I mean, those of you who are orthopedic surgeons here, they, they probably know what orthopedics is, but uh, orthopedics is basically a branch of medicine which is concerned with the correction or prevention of deformities, disorders, or injuries of the skeleton and associated structures. That's what orthopedic uh, uh, surgeons uh, uh, do. Whereas art is, is quite different uh, at first sight. It's basically the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination. I mean, it's typically in the visual form, such as painting or sculpture, but there are other art forms, producing works to be appreciated for their beauty or emotional power. And then the, the other, the third thing which comes in here is science. What is science? Because Orthopedic surgery is a mixture, mixture of art and science, in my, um, in my opinion. So science is, is a system of knowledge about the physical, chemical, and biological universe and the processes that occur in it. Now, med medicine and surgery are part of what's, what is, is uh, known as applied sciences as opposed to basic sciences. Now, if you look at the this statue here, um, which is well known, um, the statue of David by Michelangelo, um, this is the, the epitome of uh, what art can produce. The aesthetic and beauty of, the, uh, of this uh, um, sculpture is, is, is well known. Um, although some, some people have criticized that the proportions are not quite right at the head. The, the right hand is, is not in proportion, and the head is also too small for the rest of the body. It's still a, a, an, an amazing, uh, beautiful statue, and it's so alive, and uh, you have the impression that um, he will come alive and step off there and um, 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 sort of start fighting with uh, uh, Goliath, because that's uh, basically... Uh, the statue of, of, of David, who uh, defeated uh, Goliath. But it's not always about beauty. And if you look at this, this painting of Pablo Picasso, which is very well known as well, um, uh, it's called Guernica, and it was painted in, the, in 1937 during the, the Spanish Civil War. And Guernica is a... Is a, um, a town or city in the north uh, western part of Spain. It's in the Basque country, and it was attacked by um, air raided by the by by German and Italian planes uh, in 1937. Uh, they were fighting on the on the side of uh, uh, um, the uh, loyalist uh, uh, General Franco against the Republicans, and there were uh, lots of people killed. And Pablo Picasso painted this. Uh, a painting where you can see uh, the horror of, of the war. There's no beauty in there. There are um, mutilated bodies, dead, dead people, dead animals, people holding their hair, arms up towards heaven um, in horror, in pain. Um, so this, this painting is not about beauty, but expressing um, um, a feeling on it where the, the painter wants to tell uh, the audience uh, uh, his message. So I was sort of looking at sort of uh, what is, is the orthopedic surgeon actually a scientist or is the orthopedic surgeon an artist or maybe an artisan or is it simply our uh, orthopedic simply glorified carpenters? Um, and uh, I also sort of looked at sort of what is actually an artisan or craftsman versus an artist. There is a difference. And, and, and maybe orthopedic surgeons are more artisans or, or craftspeople. 
uh, as compared to artists, but there is some, uh, some art element in what orthopedic surgeons do. So an art, artisan or craftsman creates something which has more functional and utilitarian value. And that's also what orthopedic surgeons do. We, we, we improve the function of people uh, to uh, um, allow them to walk again and to participate in activities of daily living. So of, based on, which has a functional and utilitarian value, but on a repetitive basis. We, we don't create a new operation every time we operate on a patient. So we do it on a repetitive basis, whereas an artist creates something unique which communicates a message to the audience and has often an aesthetic value and not so much an, 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 an utilitarian value. And when you look at, at publications, um, they talk about the art and practice of, of, of surgery, uh, orthopedic surgery. Um, but I'm not sure whether the, the people who, who have published it, that whether what they actually mean by, by the art uh, of, uh, uh, and practice of orthopedic. So sort of, I think there is, an, as far as orthopedic is concerned, there is certainly a, a balance of, uh, and there's certainly science, there's also a little bit of, um, there's also some art, and it's basically a balance uh, uh, of the two. And now this is just, to show you what orthopedics can achieve, orthopedic surgery. This is a, a young girl I, um, I was uh, seeing in, in the Philippines where I worked uh, some years ago. And you can see here her photo before the surgery on the left and after the surgery on the right. Now she, she was actually born with congenital dislocation of the knees and her parents never took her to see a doctor. And she ended up with these legs basically looking like they had been put on backwards. So she, her knees were hyperextending to about 90 degrees. But despite this, she, she, she managed to walk um, until um, she had some surgery to correct this deformity. And you can see the result on the right-hand side. So you can, I ask you, is this science? Uh, is this art? or I'm sure there's a combination um, um, of both. Now, if you look at this, um, for example, these, these are some orthopedic implants. And, um, you know, the surgeons who have designed these, um, you know, are they artists because they created them? Um, but there's a lot of science in there as well. There's science related to biomaterials, to chemistry of alloys, and to, to um, wear resistance and tribology and all sorts of things come in there um, when they created these, these sort of hip replacements. Uh, but for me or for an orthopedic surgeon, this might look like a, a piece of art, but somebody um, in the street might say, well, these are just lumps of metal. So the the beauty is really in the eye of, of the beholder. Now, now I, I want to talk a little bit uh, and see, see what, what do artists and orthopedic surgeons have in common, actually. Now, first of all, if you look at the tools of orthopedic surgeons, they're very similar to the tools used by, by, the, by a sculpture. So on the, on the left-hand side, you've got mallet and what we call osteotomes or chisels, which are used by orthopedic surgeons to, to uh, cut bone, to, to shape bone. And uh, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, there is an, um, 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 a drawing by um, Lindsay Crooks. When he came, he came to theater and, and did some live drawing of me doing a hip replacement. And you can see there, I'm using an, a mallet and a chisel or an osteotome there to carry out um, um, a hip replacement. And his, uh, uh, the sculpture will use the same, the same sorts of tools. There is Henry Moore, who's quite a famous uh, uh, British sculptor, uh, uh, using uh, a chisel there and, uh, and, a, and a mallet uh, to carve a statue out of a piece of uh, um, rock or stone. And I came across this um, uh, sculptures by, by the same artist in 68. 
is actually represent sort of uh, 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 vertebrae, you know. Um, spinal surgeons, they operate on vertebrae. So you can see this is the, how, how the, the, the artist sees uh, vertebrae and, and they come in different shapes. And I put, put the, the vertebrae, a, a thoracic and lumbar vertebrae on the right hand side so that you can see, um, I mean, th there's obviously some, uh, um, this looks like the spinous processes there. And they all of they all of diff they all different, which is actually correct because if you go from the neck, the cervical spine down to the lumbar spine, the shape of the vertebrae changes. Plaster, orthopedic surgeons use a lot of plaster, and and so do the um, so do the, um, the the artists, the sculptors. This is by Auguste Rodin, a French sculptor, which is quite well uh, known. And this is a, um, um, a sculpture using plaster of Paris. Uh, this hand is made of plaster of Paris. Plaster of Paris is based, is, has been used uh, from very early on, from the, I think the uh, early Egyptians, the, 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 the Egyptians used it. Um, and of course, plaster is calcium sulfate. Uh, and it's, it's quite nicely, can, it's, it can be well used for, for sculptures and, and things like that. So this was Rodin, um, who used plaster for some of his work. And then, of course, orthopedic surgeons, we use plaster casts here. We use these uh, rolls. And you can see here, uh, an orthopedic surgeon is putting on a plaster on a, on a leg uh, for an, maybe a fracture or something like that. And I always, I always, that, that's the time when I mold the plaster on a patient's leg. That's when I feel like a real artist, you know. And I always keep, I always tell my, 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 my trainees, uh, orthopedic trainees, and I, there's some in the, in the room here. I'm not sure whether I told, I told him, but uh, the aesthetic part of the plaster is very important, okay, because that's what the patient sees, okay. And also this, the stitching up and, and even the bandaging is very important because the aesthetic is, it will affect the patient. Because if the, if the plaster looks messy, uh, the patient will think that the surgeon has done, as a messy surgeon, has done a messy operation. So I always, uh, um, I will, I always tell my, uh, my, my trainees, make sure the plaster looks nice. Of course, it has to be functional as well. It has to be both of it. Okay, some shared skills between the artist and the orthopedic surgeons. Uh, manual dexterity is very important, okay? And surgeons, um, they train um, and have, have to continue performing operations to, to keep their manual dexterity at the top level. It's a little bit like uh, um, athletes, you know? They have to train constantly. To, to maintain their performance or improve their, their performance. And so man, manual dexterity for the, for, the, for the surgeons, the artists, the sculptors, and the uh, um, um, painters are very important. Eye-hand coordination. You have to have a very good eye-hand coordination, and that's important uh, for both these uh, um, um, uh, professionals. Observation. Uh, yes, it's important when you are in a clinic and you see patients, the observation is very important because often that helps you in, in making the, the diagnosis. Um, and there are actually some medical courses who have incorporated art uh, into the curriculum so that the students learn about observation and that will help them in developing those, those clinical uh, skills. And artists and surgeons have an apprentice type training where they have an, um, um, uh, a trainer, um, somebody who will train them and show them um, surgical skills and artistic uh, uh, skills. So those are shared, shared skills. Sur surgeons and like the artists have to learn anatomy, okay, particularly, particularly the those who do life drawing and, and the sculptures. Of course, if they do abstract painting, uh, it doesn't, they don't need to know about anatomy. And here I found this, uh, this book here, 
It's actually found it at home. I'm not sure my wife must have got it from somewhere. I don't know. This is a, a, it's in French. It's an anatomy, the artistic anatomy of uh, the human uh, body. And it's by an, uh, um, an, uh, a person from uh, Hungary. And he is uh, a professor of artistic anatomy at the art school uh, in Budapest. And these are the drawings inside uh, the, that book, which I have at home. So this is somebody who is professor of anatomy at an art school, not a medical school. And on the right-hand side, these are drawings by Leonardo da Vinci as well, um, showing the anatomy of um, the upper limb. Uh, this guy, this person here, uh, I'm not sure who he is, whether he's an orthopedic surgeon, I don't know. Uh, sort of, uh, uh, he's got some orthopedic instruments tattooed across his chest. So uh, uh, art and orthopedics must be very close to, to this man's heart. Um, so orthopedic, is it an artistic science? And is the surgeon a scientific artist? I leave it up to you to answer that question, depending on where you stand. Now, a little bit about art and orthopedics through time, and, and it really starts sort of, I mean, orthopedic conditions were sort of represented in ancient Egypt. And here is a, here is a person, first of all, he is using a crutch. And in those days, the crutch was just a stick. But crutches has, have evolved over the years, and I'll come back to that in a moment. You can see that this person here has got an, a withered leg here. That leg is thinner than the one on the other side, and it's also short. And that's why he has to use an, uh, uh, a stick or crutch. And you can see his foot is dropped. And I presume this chap might have had poliomyelitis, I, I don't know, or any other condition and injury uh, to the, to the uh, sciatic nerve or cerebral palsy or something like that, not quite sure. Later on here, um, this is a, a quite a well-known um, um, painting um, showing uh, uh, Achilles uh, bandaging the arm of his friend Patroclus, who was injured in the, uh, um, uh, during the Trojan War. Now, Patroclus went back to war after he recovered from the injury and was killed by Hector. But because Achilles and Patroclus were very good friends, uh, to avenge his death, Achilles went back to war, and then he was he was uh, uh, he suffered an injury uh, from an arrow which perforated his, the back of his heel, uh, and hence the uh, uh, the term Achilles tendon. That's where the term Achilles tendon comes from. Now, in Florence in the 1200s, and we had a, a, a talk some months ago about this, um, the painters were actually part of the Guild of Physicians. So there's a link there. Um, and they also share a, 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 a patron saint, which is St. Luke, who was credited by St. Paul as a physician. And also painters and doctors and artists rely on each other because the painters provide the accurate drawings of the body, which are important for, for, for doctors and surgeons, particularly when they learn the anatomy. And doctors provided the anatomical knowledge, uh, which they learned from the, the dissections, provided that knowledge to the artists because they needed that as well. Although um, later on, some, there was the, the birth of the artist anatomists where the artists, they did their own dissections, not in Greece. In Greece, uh, dissections of cadavers and autopsies were not permitted, but the Romans were allowed to do it. So uh, I'm going to talk about three of them, uh, Claudius Galen, and then two from the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci, which everybody knows quite well, and Andreas Vesalius. Now, Galen was uh, a Greek uh, physician, um, and he did he dissected animals, but was not allowed to dissect uh, um, humans. So 
he was limited by, by the fact that he could not uh, um, study the human anatomy, but he developed a, a, a theory of, of, of the four humors, which was uh, uh, which how he understood that um, um, life was uh, um, uh, working. Andreas Vesalius, he did quite a lot of dissections uh, and published, an, uh, um, I think, the first probably textbook of anatomy in 1543, which was called the Corporis Fabrica. Um, and in his book, um, there are beautiful um, uh, anatomical drawings, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side here. Leonardo da Vinci, uh, well known, he was not just an anatomist, he was, a, he was an engineer, he was an inventor, he, di he did lots of, lots of things and did a lot of dissection, but also he was um, a very good artist. Um, as you know, um, um, everybody knows this, this uh, uh, famous uh, uh, painting. Um, and then, um, sorry, and then um, later on, um, in the 17th century, um, this painting of, uh, um, Rembrandt is quite famous as well and has got an interesting history. This is the, the anatomy lesson of Talp, where you can see that here's Dr. Talp, who was obviously an, an anatomy professor, and he's demonstrating here to his students uh, a dissection of uh, the left forearm of this, uh, um, uh, on this cadaver. And um, actually what's interesting is that these dissections were public. They were open to the public, and you had you could buy a ticket, an entrance uh, to those uh, um, to those dissections, and they they used to have them regularly in uh, um, in uh, uh, Netherlands in those days because Rembrandt was Dutch, um, and the um, it's interesting the 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 sort of the the name of this. Um, Cadaver here Hill, this person is known as well, and he, he was uh, um, a thief, um, and he was convicted of theft and was hanged, and his body was given to the, to the surgeons uh, um, for this uh, um, particular dissection. Here's another one uh, from, by Rembrandt. This time, this is another professor. This is the anatomy lesson of Dr. Deichmann. Yeah, over there, probably. Um, and you can see here the, um, uh, you look, it looks like the, the abdomen has already been emptied. So the, um, um, the dissection of the abdomen has, is always done first because that's where the bacteria are. And if you don't do that quickly, uh, things become sort of a bit smelly. Uh, so here the, the skull has been opened and you can see here the, um, the, the brain is, is exposed. And again here, this is an, uh, a prisoner as well, who uh, was also convicted of uh, a theft. Uh, Charles Bell, uh, he was an, an, uh, a Scottish uh, surgeon, um, and he published uh, uh, quite a number of paintings and sketches uh, uh, named The Surgical Artist at War. Um, so here you can see an, uh, a painting by Charles Bell, which shows an, a soldier with a missing arm. And basically this is a cannonball injury where the, the arm was ripped off by a cannonball uh, during um, um, uh, some battle. Uh, in those days, I'm not sure whether a patient like that probably wouldn't have survived in, in, in those days, but who knows. And this Charles Bell is also the one who... Uh, uh, described Bell's palsy, paralysis of the facial uh, nerve. It's the same person. He was, uh, um, uh, yeah. Now, some some people think that orthopedic surgeons and surgeons are but butchers. And I came across this book, which I actually bought recently. Uh, it's called the, the Butchering Art, and it's interesting because it's got two paintings there, and it's basically the history uh, uh, of surgery in the Victorian area. Um, and the advent of, of, of Lister's uh, um, discovery of carbolic acid 
to uh, uh, make those um, uh, surgeries safer uh, um, and avoid postoperative infections because most patients in those uh, uh, days uh, did not survive. So Thomas Eakins is the artist of these two paintings here. He was an uh, American um, uh, artist. And on the, on the left here, we can see this is, looks like the, uh, the professor there uh, and his assistant operating on a, on a thigh here. Um, um, this is a patient with, uh, I think, osteomyelitis. Um, this is apparently the, 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 the mother of the patient there. She's horrified and sort of is hiding her face. With, uh, she doesn't want to look. Uh, you can see there's no asepsis. I mean, they don't. They just operate in their their normal uh, clothes, their frocks there. And there's somebody writing down here uh, uh, some notes. And there's some some sort of students sitting there in the uh, um, uh, in the amphitheater. This is another one. Here, this is a different surgeon. Um, and here is it looks like there is some sort of an anesthetist sort of. Uh, giving some sort of anesthetic, and this is a, um, a mastectomy. This is the surgeon. This is actually the assistant who's doing the surgery. There's a nurse here now. I mean, now they're wearing coats or some sort of protective, uh, uh, personal protective equipment. The students are uh, interesting. Um, one of them here is asleep, uh, or a few of them are asleep. Um, as you can see, again, this is an, an operation which is done in an... In an uh, um, in it in an amphitheater, something like this. Medical illustration. Artists has also been very, very helpful in, in when it comes to medical uh, illustration, helping the surgeon uh, um, uh, understand operations. And here's one showing uh, the reduction of a, a dislocated shoulder. And this is a, a diagram by us, sort of showing the uh, posterior approach to the shoulder. John Bell, this is, um, this is another Bell, also from, uh, uh, from Edinburgh, from Scotland. And he, he sort of published an, um, a quite a nice book on um, engravings of the bones, muscle, and joint. He, he was actually uh, a surgeon at the same time as the Monroes, the professors of anatomy, uh, which... Uh, uh, um, and he, he, he disagreed with the Monroes. He said they, they are not doing the right anatomy teaching because they're not surgeons, because the Monroes were anatomists, but he was a, he was a surgeon. Um, so he did, um, um, he did quite a lot. And then this one here, John McLeese, also um, Scottish uh, anatomist, who published uh, a, a surgical anatomy treatise. And I was fascinated by, by, the, um, by the drawings. These don't look, these people, they don't look like cadavers. They look like Sort of more like patients who are still alive, um, which was quite interesting. And he his drawings, he also wrote a book on dislocations and fractures in 1859, and also beautiful drawings here. This is a Collie's fracture. This is a fracture just above the wrist, mainly which occur mainly in ortho, uh, osteoporotic uh, uh, patients, and is a beautiful drawing showing the deformity uh, of such a fracture. Another one I came across is Sir William Orpen, um, an, an, a British uh, uh, anatomist. And he, he did this interesting drawing, he, this anatomical study after Michelangelo in 1906. This is the original uh, Michelangelo statue, which is in the Medici Chapel in, uh, in Venice. And this is Aurora. This is a, a, um, a statue of Aurora. And he, he did this. This is, this is basically to show what's under the skin. So where you can see here, this is, this is um, Michelangelo. This is the anatomist, which shows you uh, the muscles under the skin of this reclining uh, uh, person. Frank Netto, a lot of, of surgeons know about this. Uh, he was a surgeon, American surgeon, who was beautifully, has beautifully illustrated uh, the anatomy. And he was actually, I think he was the Michelangelo of, of medicine. And he published an atlas of human anatomy in 1989, which uh, um, I certainly used for my, um, my anatomy studies. You can see beautiful, beautiful um, uh, drawings there. 
of the brachial plexus. Now, I will finish off with going through some orthopedic pathology represented by the artist. There's a lot of paintings. If you look carefully and you study them, you find some orthopedic pathology. This is a painting by Raphael, um, The Healing of the Lame Man. So there is St. John and St. Peter outside the temple in Jerusalem, and they are, uh, there's somebody uh, sitting there who has a deformity of the lower limbs. Here is one who cannot stand up, who is walking on his knees, uh, and they are basically healing them. And then this is interesting, these kids, these children, there you can see their, their muscles are hypertrophied. They're really big muscle, unusual. And I was wondering whether they had a condition which is called Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which you can get in those children where they get pseudo-hypertrophy because the muscle is replaced by fat. This one is an, an unusual painting. Um, it's a 16th century painting, and it shows a disabled man lying. The, the artist is unknown. If you look at the head, it looks pretty normal, and he's got a ruff around his neck and a red cap like that. His trunk is fine, but you can see his, his limbs are really thin, and they are flexed and deformed, and his elbows are also straight. So this... This obviously, this man was unable to walk and had to sort of, uh, sort of. Well, I'm not even sure whether he was able to crawl or whether somebody had to sort of carry him around. So this this condition is probably uh, what's called arthrogryposis. It's a condition which uh, children are born with stiff joints, um, um, and some of them require extensive surgery and physiotherapy to keep them. Uh, uh, to allow them to walk, uh, uh, etc. Um, this is a, a series of seven uh, uh, paintings or panel paintings by um, by somebody, an, an unknown, uh, an unknown um, uh, painter, but called Master of Alkmaar. Alkmaar is a city in 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 Holland. And the relevant one to orthopedics is the one here on the left. And this is the feeding of the hungry. So you can see this man here is sitting. He cannot stand. He's holding out his hand. See his, his, his feet are twisted and deformed. And he's using some sort of tripod there to, to propulse him along. So he's shuffling on, on his bottom. And uh, um, if we look, if you look at this closer, you can see that on the left hand side, the left foot has got seven toes. So he's got what's called polydactyly. And the condition is basically uh, um, um, tibial deficiency. He has got a, a fibula bone, but no tibia. And that's a recognized condition. Here's a child who has got this condition, uh, uh, which is called tibia hemimelia. This is another painting of the seven acts of charity by Peter Bruegel. Peter Bruegel is also a very uh, well-known Flemish Dutch artist. And here you can see uh, a similar person there who is also uh, uh, begging for food. Now, he, he, you can see his legs here are bent backwards, right up the, the hips are hyperextended, the knees are flexed. And he cannot he cannot walk. He's, his pelvis is in some sort of a, uh, a basket there, and he uses some slippers to be able to propulse his, his uh, body along the um, the floor. And it looks like he's incontinent as well because he wears something which looks like a nappy. So this probably probably has got congenital malformation of the spine with absence of the of the sacrum. Now this. Um, this is obviously a dwarf, and they were very popular um, uh, uh, in Spain at the Spanish courts. And this is a portrait of um, a dwarf called Sebastian de Mora by Diego Velasquez. And you can see his arms are short, his legs are short, but his, his trunk and head are normal. So this is a short-limbed dwarf, and the condition is achondroplasia. Um, a French artist here, um, 
And this painting is called Mireille giving arms at the exit of Saint Trophim. Saint Trophim is a, an old um, church in Arles in the south of France. And this is a well-dressed lady, obviously leaving church, giving this uh, a beggar, this, this kid here, some uh, uh, arms, uh, some money. He's got a bear, he's got a, he's using a crutch, a little bit uh, sort of a, a more sophisticated than the one the Egyptians use. And he's got a bandaged foot, obviously something abnormal there. And he's got an uh, accordion, accordion sort slung over his shoulder. So here's the evolution of the crutch. So a simple stick. And then this, this chap I've just shown you has got an axillary piece there, which goes into the axilla. And then the axillary crutches, the wooden ones, and then the more modern crutches here. This is a famous uh, uh, painting by um, another Spanish artist called the Clubfoot, because this chap here, he, uh, you have the impression he's carrying a gun, but that's actually his crutch. And he's got a deformed foot, a club foot, which is a, a congenital malformation of the foot, which we, we, we still see here in New Zealand, uh, particularly in the Maori population. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, quite a difficult condition to treat unless you start straight after birth. And here's another crippled boy here. He's also using a crutch. His leg is short uh, and... Uh, uh, his pelvis is tilted here. Amputations often uh, represented uh, by artists. This is a, uh, uh, an amputation done on, on the king, uh, the, the uh, Friedrich, Friedrich, Friedrich III, who was the um, emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor. This is in, uh, was carried out in, in Austria in Linz where he had his leg amputated. He had, apparently had atherosclerosis. He only survived the amputation a month and then uh, died. Amputations on the, uh, uh, on the battlefield were common in, um, in, the, uh, um, last century, in the 19th century. Here's an amputation on, a, on an injured soldier uh, on the battlefield. This is a famous French surgeon, Ambroise Paré, who uh, really did quite a lot of work on um, war injuries. And he was the first one to use ligature where they ligate the, uh, the artery to prevent, to, to reduce the bleeding. Here's the saw, the amputation saw, and these are obviously some of his instruments. Um, here is an, uh, an, a Russian-Ukrainian artist who, um, has represented here in uh, an Easter procession here. And you can see here, there are quite a number of children with crutches and they are prevented from, uh, from um, joining the, um, the procession there by pe people restraining them. Uh, um, I mean, obviously there's a number of possible conditions uh, which uh, have affected these children. Frida Kahlo is an interesting, she's a surrealist uh, painter and a Mexican artist. And this is an interesting one, it's called The Broken Column. Um, so she had, she was involved, she had polio as a child, was a very promising student and was about to start studying medicine when she was involved in a uh, motor vehicle accident. She had a broken spine and spent a lot of time in hospital in a plaster cast. And that's, that's when she started uh, painting. And you can see here, um, the spine is visible there. And it looks like there are metal rods up and down the spine. She had some spinal surgery, which was unsuccessful. It also shows you some sort of spinal brace. And she did a lot of painting on chronic pain because she had chronic pain. And you can see here the pins uh, stuck in her uh, body everywhere to represent the pain she was suffering. Uh, Polish artist here, which shows a little um, girl here. Uh, uh, the painting is called Girl with a Red Hat, but she has not got a red head as far as I can tell. She's got a bit of reddish hair, but she's got a deformed right arm here, with, uh, um, um, uh, which, is, which, is, which is called, uh, this is an obstetric palsy, where the, uh, during the birth, the brachial plexus has been stretched. And some of the muscles which control the uh, shoulder joint and the elbow are not working. So she has got that deformity there. This is a 
painting by Claude Monet. Interestingly here is, this is a girl holding her doll. If you look at her feet, her feet are turned inwards, whereas the doll has got normal, the normally, normal outturn of the feet. So this, this, this kid has got what we call pigeon-toed, where people walk with their feet turned inwards. Because when we are born, our, our hips are turned inwards, but then over time they turn out. Uh, but in some people it doesn't happen. So she's got uh, what's called persistent femoral um, antiversion. Tiny Tim, everybody knows about Tiny, Tiny Tim from the uh, um, um, Christmas Carol by Dickens. And here we see Bob Cratchit here carrying Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim as Tim as he is, is small. So he's had some sort of condition which stunted his growth. And you can see he's got splints on which uh, extend above the knee. And he probably, Tiny Tim probably had, had rickets and the splints were there to to splint his knees uh, because he probably had got bow legs or, or knock knees. Another a Spanish artist here that was called the Sad, Sad Inheritance here showing a monk here looking after kids uh, at the beach. You can see these kids all have wasted legs, wasted lower limbs and deformities like bent knees, they're all using crutches. And this one here, has got the typical uh, 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 um, thigh uh, knee gait, probably due to poliomyelitis. These kids probably had poliomyelitis. And due to the, the, the uh, weakness of the quadriceps, they have to push their, their knee backwards, otherwise they can't walk because the knee will collapse. Now to finish off, this is another story which is very similar to my story where I got involved with an artist and the artist came to theater with me and did some life drawing. This is a story of a, an orthopedic surgeon in the south of England who worked at the, uh, in Exeter, the, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Exeter, Norman Carpenter, Capener, sorry, Capener. There's one instrument named after him, the Capener Gouge. And this uh, lady, Barbara Hepworth, who's a very famous uh, 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 English sculptor. Now, Capener, was treating uh, Barbara Hepworth's daughter who had osteomyelitis and operated on her daughter many times. So Barbara got interested in, and, and, and Capner invited, uh, invited her to theater to come and do some drawings, just the same as I invited Lindsay uh, Crooks to come in with, uh, with me. And uh, um, she did quite a number of, of drawings. And here is just a few of them where she represented the surgeons, they really looked like priests, like with their hands sort of uh, uh, in a prayer position. And she felt that in theater, that sort of an operation was like, like being at church, you know, with the, the surgeons being the priests and sort of, sort of the operating theater being the, um, the altar. So she did quite a number of those drawings, quite interesting. Uh, finally, there are, two artists I come across who, who were affected by orthopedic conditions. One was Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, um, and the other one was Pierre-Auguste Renoir, two French surgeons. Now, uh, Renoir had rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see here um, in his old age, he's got very deformed hands here because rheumatoid arthritis attacks the joints. It's an autoimmune disease which attacks the joints and damage the, the lining of the joints, and then eventually the joints become destroyed. Here is a typical hand with swelling of the knuckles, dislocated of the knuckle joints, very stiff hands. But he persevered. He continued until he died in 1919. And this is his last, one of his last paintings done in 1919. So despite the fact that he was very disabled, had very stiff and deformed hands, he was still able to uh, do some beautiful painting. And this man here, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, he had a condition is called pycnodysostosis, which leads to dwarfism as well. You can see his arms and his legs are short. And if you look at his, normally your, normally your hands should reach at least the middle of the thigh, if not the distal of the thigh. But here, his, his arms, his hands only um, reach the, the hips. And he did quite a lot of drawing of the Bohemian and the nightlife in Paris. Um, it's quite famous, famous for that. 
and I understand he died of alcoholism and uh, 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 syphilis. So interestingly, when I was working in Africa, in Malawi uh, last year, I saw a child with pycnodysostosis, and they actually have, uh, the bone is very uh, dense, but it's weak. It's, it's weak and it, and it breaks. And actually, uh, Lord, to, uh, Toulouse Lautrec, he had two fractured femurs uh, in his youth, and um, uh, that's because the bone is, uh, is uh, uh, weak and brittle. And you see this child fell off a tree and had a fractured neck of femur here. Here the hip is broken there. And I had to um, operate on, on him and uh, fix this with some plates and screws. Uh, some surgeons have got amazing ideas. And this surgeon here, sort of what I call explant art, when sometimes when we remove implants, like implants used for internal fixation or joint replacements, like these are femoral components of a, hip, of a knee replacement, these are tibial components of a, of a knee replacement. He's used some, of the, this is a, for the jaw, he used an, a, a femoral stem. For the eyes, these are uh, femoral heads. Uh, so he, he used this to produce some, some art. Uh, um, quite interesting. So this is my last slide. Um, by the way, that's not me. I'm not sure who that is, but it's a surgeon uh, resting after this uh, surgery. A few quotes um, from the uh, um, Latin. Art is long, but life is short. Let us improve life through science and art. And art with science is nothing. Uh, I think that applies mainly to the architecture, where you, uh, if you build an, a beautiful cathedral, there has to be some science, you know? If it's only art, it will not, it will not work. It will fall down. And interestingly, um, uh, medicine, some, the Romans or some people have said medicine is the art of guessing. So thank, thank you very much uh, for attending. I hope uh, um, I have um, um, outlined where I believe uh, art and orthopedic surgeon, surgery comes uh, comes together. Uh, thank you very much. Now, Jean Claude, questions. First of all, do you have an opinion about the meaning or the origin of the name orthopedic? In yeah. Greek, orthos is straight, and the pedic bit could be either child or foot. That, that's right. No, it's child, actually. Ortho, orthopedics, uh, there's a French surgeon, uh, André, who coined that, that term, and he wrote uh, a book about the art of straightening uh, children with deformities. So it's orthos is straight, from orthogonal, and paidon, paidon means child. So it was basically, uh, and the, um, the logo of the orthopedic of orthopedics is a crooked tree tied to a straight pole. So where you're trying to correct deformities gradually by pulling the, uh, the, the crooked spine, which is basically scoliosis, by pulling it gradually towards the straight stake. And that's exactly what all the spinal surgeons do. They put a, a straight rod into the back and then they pull the vertebrae to the, to the rod to correct the, the scoliosis, the deformity. Yes, it means straight spine, a uh, straight spine. chart. Okay. Other questions? Are there any questions on the um, internet? No? No. Well, Jean-Claude, you've um, entertained us and baffled us with knowledge and science. Please join me in thanking Jean-Claude for an absolutely marvellous presentation.